Hi, it's Jan Beta, and I got sent this, which is, as it says, a C64 component video mod prototype 1. Not for resale. I got sent this from vgpvideogameperfection.com uh, to test it, actually, because they are going to, or they're planning to sell these, and uh, also, they're considering offering like a uh, installation service for these, so you can uh, send your C64 into VGP and have this installed. And I'm going to take a look at this on camera today. Uh, it's a special treat for me and a special treat for you, hopefully. So uh, I find this very, very interesting. So here it is. Uh, this consists actually of two boards. One is this, and here's another smaller board. Let's take a closer look. So here's this is where the magic happens. Uh, let me open this. This is uh, made by Copper Dragon, and you actually can get the layout for this board and the Gerber files and everything you need to build your own on GitHub this address which I'm going to link in the description as well. So this has an Altera Max 10. This is actually doing the whole, this is like a graphics card that just takes the C64 uh, signals that go to the VIC-2 and uh, converts them to a component video output which is uh, higher resolution and uh, better color fidelity and like a more modern, it's not HDMI, it's a, an analog signal that you get, but it is a more modern signal than you have from the S-Video or not even S-Video, pre-S-Video that you can get out of your C64 normally. So this is way better quality video output and it outputs the video over a little, uh, little funnel jack. You can switch some resolutions with this switch here. And this board also is a replacement. You might have guessed it if you have worked on C64s before. There are like these uh, little drillings. These fit, if you just use pin headers, these fit where the RF modulator normally goes in the C64. So this is also a replacement for the RF modulator. And according to the uh, GitHub from Copper Dragon, it is also uh, keeping the video signal that comes from the regular um, AV from the C64. It keeps that signal intact, so you can also use the composite signal as you would with the normal C64 uh, cable. And you can also use the S-Video or pre-S-Video signal that you get there, Luma and Chroma. So this is one part of the whole business. The other part is this, which apparently, well, I can't even get this out because the pins poke through there. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. Okay, this goes into the socket uh, that the VIC-2 goes and the VIC-2 goes on top. So um, the VIC-2 is still in function. And this then plugs into this board and you get the component video output here. Uh, so I think what I want to do is to put this in my C64 and see if this is any good. So this is actually my daily driver C64 uh, that I use for streaming and, and everything basically and uh, it is modded I consider this my machine that looks original from the outside but has quite some stuff under the hood. Uh, this has a uh, kernel switcher and it has a uh, replacement DC to DC 5 volt regulator and yeah it has been recapped of course there's heat sinks in there as you're going to see. There's one screw missing actually <laughs> but that doesn't matter much to me. But anyway, this is going to be the 64 that I am going to put uh, this in. Oh, it's actually yellowed from the bottom, I didn't see that yet. <laughs> but 
But this is a trash picked C64 that I've been using. It had a broken PLA, I believe, in the beginning when I got it. Ah, look at that. <laughs> okay, uh, so what I want to do is to desolder the RF modulator and then put this board in here, which should fit without any modifications to the case. Yeah, it looks, looks good. Um, and put the other little PCB, where is it? There, under the uh, VIC-2 chip. And then like video capture the output and see if we can find any peculiar, peculiar things happening or if it just gives me a much better uh, video output, which I of course hope, because that would be brilliant. Um, yeah, I won't need the RF modulator anymore anyway, and supposedly the uh, old uh, picture output will still work, so that's a great feature, I think, because you still have the possibility to have the old school output. Um, yeah, and that should improve too, actually, because the RF modulator usually uh, introduces some like noise into the, the signal and some fuzziness. Uh, the composite signal is mixed inside here, and I think this has uh, been recapped. There are little capacitors in there as well, and sometimes if you recap this, it's going to help the picture quality, especially if you're using a composite out. So this is my everyday machine. Uh, I am going to work on this now and I hope that the uh, Copper Dragon board is going to work fine. The RF modulator definitely has been, had been desoldered before. As I do Which is good because that's going to be easier. This is the the most uh, difficult step in this whole process, I think. So uh, you have to desolder all these contacts, and you have to desolder these uh, bigger. These are like um, from the metal shield protruding through the PCB to hold it in place better. You have to desolder these as well. But that's, that's the most uh, difficult part in this whole uh, installation process. So that's not very difficult. It can be if you don't have the right equipment and or not enough patience to do it. Um, you need a lot of patience sometimes to wiggle these things out. Sometimes they are ridiculously um, heavily soldered in like on the side here. I think this one had a blob on here. Uh, but usually you have to make, take good care of these connections because these are the actual connections for the video signals. So if you break those, it's not going to work. Or at least in this case, the regular video output is not going to work anymore. Yeah, but this, as this has been soldered on before, this it's relatively fresh flux, like two or three years. And it's okay. So this desolders really easily. Usually you have to put a bit more effort in it. So which other one do we need? I think we need this one as well. Yep. Okay, this one is still a bit stubborn. There we go. So these are the uh, contacts that transport the video signals. Just gonna clean this up a bit while we are on the back side here. Uh, yeah, but that's the most difficult part in this whole installation process, I think. Now it's just a matter of uh, soldering on like little uh, pin headers, so we can have the other board installed. Oh, recapped in two so 2017. <laughs> Never thought I would be the one uh, seeing this again. 
recapped and socketed. Okay. So I think what I socketed is the, um, the processor got socketed for some reason. Maybe that was broken or maybe that was socketed on this board. Definitely the PLA got socketed. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, yeah, didn't think I would be the one to see this again. It's like uh, uh, three years ago now maybe or like at least two and a half or something like that. Interesting. Uh, okay, so what I want to do now is to put little uh, pin headers in here and see if I can fit the board nicely. I'm using these uh, round precision ones, but I think you can also use uh, the square ones, which are a bit cheaper, I believe. But these are the ones I found first, so I'm going to use those. I need four and four. And one of the four just fell to the floor. <laughs> so there we go, these are... We need two of these to connect our board to the main board, actually. So let's just do a bit of a test fit here, I guess. Okay, so this works. Yeah, so we need some something to stand this off, I guess. Want this roughly at the same height. Okay, and I just saw that there are little holes for standoffs that actually can go in these holes here. So you would solder on uh, more of the pin headers on the PCB to have it um, elevate a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's nice. So let's see uh, which height this has to go so that the um, case parts fit actually. Yeah, it's too low. We can just use uh, like sockets to plug into these. Yeah, that would make sense. I guess I'm just going to fit sockets. So I'm just going to try and fit these uh, sockets there and then plug in the PCB. That would make sense, I guess. Yeah, this makes more sense. This definitely makes more sense. So this is the correct height, so we're just going to um, solder in these. Um, and, yeah. We're just going to use these. Which is also, it's a good idea, anyway, I guess. Because we can always remove it again. That's gonna be perfect. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I have to solder on the standoffs from the back of the board still. I think it doesn't hurt to have a bit more stability there. Okay, there we go. And this should also be removable. Yeah, it is. I ended up using square uh, pin headers for the uh, non-plug side, so um, these are square pins because they work better, they fit better. This doesn't hold very well. There we go. That's a nice blob that should hold it in place. Um, now it's just a matter of uh, taking out the VIC and putting this uh, header board on the socket and connecting it to this board. Okay, removing the VIC-2. There we go. And now I'm putting on the header. It should have yeah, this direction. It's kind of obvious because the cable goes uh, to the other PCB, of course. Yeah, this fits, it just fits. 
<laughs> next to the uh, 8701 there. And then we have to angle this and put it on here. Oh, there's no marking of pin 1 here. That's okay. It should be like this, I guess. At least I hope so. Yeah, you can angle this at a nicer angle, but I'm just going to leave it like so. Putting the VIC-2 chip back in. Carefully. Of course, you want to keep the right orientation. And this is also going to fit into uh, C64C cases, I guess, because it's so flat. If you have a heatsink, I don't know. It might be a bit tight there, but uh, yeah, it should work with Audi heatsink with the standard C64C case. So the header actually goes on here like this. So um, there's a little, like a little protruding thing, and that's also marked on the board. So uh, this should be like this. That's how this is supposed to be. Pin one, the red uh, line there goes towards the outside of the computer on the connectors here. Okay, uh, so this should, in theory, be the whole mod. So, and here's how this looks from the outside. You can't really see it. I don't have the screws in yet. Um, you can't really see it, but there's another connector there. But pretty much you don't have to drill any holes or anything, so you, and you can handle the switch with some, uh, like a screwdriver or something. There's the um, three-way switch there where there normally is a two-way switch uh, on some C64s for high and low frequency bands for the RF modulation and uh, yeah, there's the uh, RCA jack for the antenna cable usually and now we have a little funnel jack there which looks pretty much stock so this is really nice Okay, for actually connecting a component cable I'm going to use one of these adapter cables which are like standard um, composite and stereo sound video adapter cables that have like uh, the TRRS <laughs> plugs which are like um, tip ring ring sleeve so uh, like four contacts on this plug and that's exactly what we need for this we just have to figure out which of the components which are uh, Y, PB and PR uh, usually designated by red, blue and green cable or plug. Uh, we just have to figure out which one is which. So, and then we should be able to connect this here. Yeah, which actually fits, of course. And uh, then we should be able to plug the respective cables into a component enabled uh, television or into my OSSC upscaler. That is what I'm going to try now. Whew. Okay, let's first uh, hook this up again like a normal C64 through the video output here and see if that still works, which it should in theory. And of course I have an appropriately color-coded uh, component cable <laughs> that we are going to use. Okay, there apparently is one more thing that I completely forgot about. There is a little jumper that sets the voltage for the VIC-2. Uh, so you have to close it for a 12 volt VIC and leave it open for a 5 volt VIC. And as I have the old version of the VIC-2, in this board, we have to close it for the 12 volts. There we go. Oh, now I just screw the board back in while I'm here. Okay, so I have now set this up in my Commodore 64 corner that you can see here. I have a CRT running 
that is directly connected to the still working composite out in this case because this doesn't have um, Luma Chroma input but the composite is connected to the Philips monitor there. The middle monitor is showing the picture from the component mod going through the OSSC that you can faintly see in the corner there and uh, yeah I'm just going to try some stuff with this setup and show you some of the footage that I'm going to capture uh, through my video capturing card so you can see the quality. The picture looks very very crisp. The only thing I can see right away is that the color is slightly off. This has like a greenish tint to it. Don't know if that's intentional but uh, according to the documentation you can actually change the color palette that the component mod has uh, in software from the C64. <laughs> so we're probably going to tinker with that a bit. Uh, yeah, let me try some stuff and for that purpose I am going to play some games and watch some demos and really uh, try to stress the FPGA chip that is doing the graphics processing on this mod board. Uh, I'm going to do a Twitch stream later today. I'm going to show you some footage from that and yeah if you want to participate in Twitch streams like that please check out my Twitch channel which is going to be linked in below. And uh, yeah you're probably not going to see this one because this is uh, before the video is released obviously <laughs> unless you have a time machine. And I'm also going to do some lag testing with uh, running both of these at the same time and looking at some slowed down footage of it. So what I'm going to do now is to actually play a game while comparing both monitors to see if we have any lag, which we technically shouldn't have, but yeah, we're going to see. I think I want to play some Joanna Sisters which I have also prepared for later because that's quite a good uh, game to see the lag actually. So I'm just going to uh, capture some footage of this. I think I'm going to set the camera to a uh, high speed so you can see the actual lag better. <laughs> I'm going to compare that. Uh, you are going to see some slight uh, messed up stuff from the CRT obviously because this has scan lines and it's really difficult to sync the uh, video of the camera with the uh, actual CRT 100%. I'm trying my best to, to sync it. And I think uh, this should virtually have no lag in this setup. So let's let's try that. I'm just going to shut up and uh, yeah, I'm just going to set the camera for high speed and we're going to take a look. So I think you could see um, how well this actually works. I think there's there's virtually no lag, uh, even through the OSSC, which introduces some lag, and also the old uh, monitor, the TFT monitor, should introduce some extra lag because that's not very modern and doesn't have. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know which uh, frequency this actually um, runs at. But it's probably going to be 60 Hz maximum, so um, yeah, this is a very nice D3. 
device to have to play uh, Commodore 64 on an original machine through a modern TV or modern niche TV that has either has a component input or you, you're using an upscaler uh, and connect the TV via HDMI. Yeah, let me just show you some footage from the uh, Twitch stream. So I'm basically going to travel into the future now. And after that, I'm going to talk a bit about my findings and my kind of my verdict about this device. So I did indeed do uh, a pretty nice little stream, which was two and a half hours long, I believe, or like nearly three hours, I think. So I tested uh, quite some demos that were suggested to me by people on Twitter, actually. And yeah, the thing, as far as I can see, works flawlessly, pretty much. So um, all the weird effects that um, were used in the demos seem to display fine on the component mods. So I think that thing is pretty much flawless. I couldn't find anything that looked uh, weird or glitchy in those demos. And yeah, at one point it crashed, but that was probably um, not because of the component mod, because that should not interfere with anything else than uh, the video. And uh, like it was like a processor crash but it's not due to the video. I found this really um, useful for streaming because I can basically use the signal from the component uh, to upscale that and um, stream it through my uh, capturing card. And I could also use the uh, CRT on the old AV connector uh, in parallel. So I would have a CRT to play games on or whatever I'm going to do to have the real experience and uh, yeah still have a very crisp picture to stream it. The quality of the picture is uh, quite good, the scrolling was very smooth uh, so there's no worries there at all. So what's my verdict about this device? Uh, the only real point of criticism I have is that the color palette is a bit too saturated. It looks more like an emulator, but that was um, like Copper Dra Dragon himself uh, stated that. And you can change it in software. I'm going to link the uh, GitHub where the software is available in the description as well. So you can fiddle around with that. I didn't do it because the palette looks good, it just doesn't look original. So I, I quite like it in a way, but it's not the original Commodore 64 palette. It just looks too vibrant. <laughs> but it's great for watching demos and playing games and stuff like that, I guess. It just doesn't invoke the whole nostalgia thing. One particular thing I found in my setup is that with using the Ultimate um, 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus that I have here, I get a slight uh, hiss noise through the audio out on the... The audio out also comes through the AV socket as usual. You don't have audio out on the component mod itself, obviously, because that only has the video out. Um, audio comes through the old AV jack so you will have to um, either make a cable or use a an old cable that has a and only use audio from that to have audio output. I uh, found that with the Ultimate 2 Plus you get a noise on the audio out with the component mod. Probably, this is merely guessing, it's because the um, the Ultimate 2 Plus isn't very uh, nicely shielded, so you have like uh, some interference into the signals on the uh, component board. So yeah, there's some weird interference there because the component uh, mod board isn't uh, shielded like the RF modulator is, that is in this metal can thing. Uh, the component mod doesn't have that, so there's no shielding, there's virtually no shielding on the Ultimate 2 Plus, so there's some kind of interference happening there. 
but it's not very loud and uh, I used it on stream and nobody noticed. <laughs> I noticed it for a bit but uh, nobody else noticed so it probably isn't that bad after all. What else? It gets a bit warm but nothing to worry about. Uh, the FPGA, they, they get warm but uh, it's all good about that and there's ventilation uh, slots in the C64K is um, just where it sits so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, it doesn't get hot or anything, just gets uh, warm to the touch. So no worries there. Works absolutely flawlessly. The installation is not too bad. Um, I want to point you to two other people who made videos about this device, uh, the open source thing earlier than, than I did this. Uh, that's BWAG who did a very good video and explains in detail why this works the way it does and how it works. And uh, he takes a look at the circuit board and stuff and he's much more educated about these kinds of things than I am. So recommend watching his video which I'm going to link in the description and in the corner there. And then there's uh, Kieferknistern, a German, fellow German YouTuber who also did a number of videos about that and uh, among other things he put one of these component mods into an Aldi C64 <laughs> which is pretty interesting and it worked well for him as well so I'm going to link his video in the corner and in the description as well. So other than that this thing has no lag at all as we've seen the only lag that got introduced in my test probably came from the upscaler and or the old TFT monitor that I'm using. So technically this doesn't have any lag. If you were to be using it on a CRT would have absolutely the same uh, frequency and sync as the original signal from the C64. So that's great. One thing I haven't really mentioned yet is uh, that you have this little switch uh, where you can switch uh, different uh, resolutions basically. Usually this runs on 312p. You can switch it to 624p which is useful for using it on uh, some TVs because the picture already gets upscaled by the hardware before it reaches the TV. For use with the OSSC or a good upscaler like this uh, it isn't necessary. You also have the option uh, to add scan lines, the scan line simulator at 624p. I'm not a huge fan of scan line emulators, I don't know about you. Uh, you could, the, the scan line emulation in the OSSC is a lot better than this. This is just a very um, yeah, basic scan line thing. But there are a lot of people who like that to get that um, old school look on their modern TV. And if you have a TV with component input, you can use this for emulating scan lines. So no idea if you can see this, but uh, this is the scan line emulation on, which looks kind of old school. It kind of looks good, but I'm not a fan, as I said. I prefer the clear picture when I have it. Yeah, so all in all, this is a very impressive and useful add-on for the C64. It should work on all uh, flavors of the C64, on the um, old boards, on the new boards. It has not been extensively tested on some special boards, but um, as far as I can see there's no reason why it wouldn't work on uh, the old KU boards, for example, and uh, like some NTSC C64s haven't been tested in some configurations, but yeah, it, it, it's a very nice way of uh, getting a very crisp picture out of your good old C64. So thanks very much to Matt from VGP for sending this to me for testing. And I'm going to write a, an email to him uh, with my findings about this. I can only say good things about this really. So um, yeah, very nice device, uh, highly recommended. I have no idea at which price they are going to sell it. Uh, the FPGA alone is around 40 euros or something like that, so I guess it's going to be more on the expensive side, 
but I think it's worth it for a lot of reasons. So yeah, looking forward to seeing this hit the shelves, so to say, or hit the online shops. So this was me testing a prototype component mod for the C64. I hope you enjoyed this, hope this was informative and I hope to talk to you in the comments and yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Thanks for your clicks and thanks for your subscriptions. Special thanks as usual to my Patreon supporters and everybody else who donated to this channel. Thanks for making this possible. I'm Jan Beta, thanks for watching. See you all soon. Bye! So this is the one, isn't it? Don't even know if all the stages are in here yet. Well, that was close. <laughs> it's just one. Ah. Okay. I'm officially getting a bit tired. Or can I jump down there? No, I can't possibly jump down there. That was that was good. Okay. Use the force. Luke. Oh.